the cognitive complexity of issues that the world faces is more than a single person can process. A single brain that can't actually hold that cognitive complexity. So it requires collective intelligence and collective sense. We're probably not going to solve the complex, wicked existential problems we face with individual horsepower playing rivalrous games. We're probably going to need to get together and be able to create a higher form of collective intelligence and sense making. Now what? And how? So the, the answer now what is decentralized collective intelligence. Great. How? How do we do that? So this is a film, it's an intro to our new series about collective intelligence. And it's also quite a significant moment, I think, because it's about the trajectory of the channel up until now, rounding off part of that journey of discovery and also talking about where we're going next. And that also brings in some live events and we're releasing two films, one, uh, both of which I'm really excited about, but one in particular, the trilogue between Jamie Wheel, Jordan Greenhall and Daniel Schmachtenberger that was recorded about three or four months ago. Members will have seen it and now we're releasing it to, to everyone. And I think it's the, it's the most complete version of what we, this sort of inquiry into collective intelligence that we've been, been not, and it wasn't, wasn't where the channel started, but it's where the channels ended up. Coherence is this ephemeral emergent property, best never named, never subject to right. reality capture, reality tunnel capture, like yes. it's that thing then how the hell do you scale it? Because we're storytelling monkeys, and at some point we need recipes to help the thing propagate. So this goes Unless back to everybody's the question just of Yoda Zen. Why does it always break down? Mm -hmm. why, do, why every time we try to scale does it break down? One of the reasons is because, as our friend Lao Tzu discovered, and by the way, also our friend Buddha discovered, and our friend Jesus discovered, every time the storytelling monkeys try to turn into a story to tell, they fuck it up. So let's be mindful of that and recognize that the storytelling piece of it definitely isn't the answer. And I think this is sort of, we're going to talk about where we're going to go next, but we're also going to summarize, we're going to kind of frame it in a way, explain how we think the pieces fit together and play some clips from some of those films and some of the other films that we put out on the channel. There's a theme to all of this, which is truth. So it's a theme that's been running through the channel from the very beginning, from when you went out to interview Jordan Peterson, to then we covered the intellectual dark web phenomena. And that was really about people sitting down and against the backdrop of an incredibly chaotic, polarized culture where truth has become hyper-relative, you know, some people have called it a post-truth world. It's always been an, some kind of inquiry and some kind of quest to say, how do we arrive at truth together? So I think the intellectual dark web, those long-form conversations, was a great first step in that. But We've been saying since that era as well, since maybe this time last year, there's a deeper resolution to it. There's a deeper way for us to come into contact with each other and arrive at something that feels like it wants to emerge into the culture. So that's kind of moving into an edge and a novelty that we haven't quite arrived at yet. And that's very exciting. Mm. Yeah, and it's something that I said in the conversation with Guy Sengstock. So the other piece that we're putting out, putting out the trilogue and also a uh, conversation with Guy Sengstock who invented circling and we'll talk a bit more about what that why we think that's relevant in a minute but we talked about how Jordan Peterson and John Bavaki as well had this quality of there's something in the way they they talk certainly when they're at their best where they're they're not they're going on an exploration and there's a sense of an emergent journey that they're going on and you're you're going with them that that they kind of that they're, they're, they're really tapped into an inquiry. It's not just they're telling you what they know, they're thinking in real time. I think when people talk about what they like about Jordan Peterson, they like the experience of, he, of listening to him because both John and, um, and Jordan, you're right. They have this quality of that to understand what they're saying, you must actually think the thought that they're thinking. And, and because they're right at the, at, on a, just at the, they're just always like trying to speak what's just beyond the horizon, right? And you almost have to allow yourself to be changed by it. Yes, yes, yes. 
What I love about uh, this piece that we're going to deliver now and this whole subject is that it brings together the big picture, the sort of philosophy, the systems change, the, the really deep inquiries that some of the, the, the guests on our channel have gone into, into the sort of the more uh, interpersonal, interrelated. So circling is a form of inquiry. So it's a, it's a modality that I think Guy said he came up with it about 20 years ago and came up with it spontaneously and it took a while to actually give it a name but it was a form of conversation that felt really alive like how how can we have these conversations that feel really alive we've all had conversations where we've come into the conversation one way and something about the dialogue right maybe it was super personal maybe it was philosophical but there's something about the meeting such that you walked away and you are different somehow. Circling, you could say, is a yoga of those kinds of conversations. It's about whatever those asanas, those postures and communication, it's fundamentally stretching, strengthening that muscle that is both available and generative of those kinds of unexpected life-changing conversations. I really enjoyed that conversation. There's an amazing conversation as well that you had with John Viveki that we'll put the link in because that was really fascinating. And they both went into this real space of inquiry together. And you can just tell there's something about that kind of a live conversation that just registers on some really deep level, whether we're in it or whether we're watching it. And there's sort of this thirst for that. And it's a, it's a difficult thing to do, especially if you're if you have some kind of public profile and it's happening in the media where you're around complicated subjects, difficult subjects, where people get very triggered and get very defensive very quickly, uh, which incidentally links back to the films that we put out about the kind of neuroscience of difficult conversation, call it the, the neuroscience of polarization. But that's in, incredibly relevant as well. And the need for psychological safety to have these conversations. Slight digression, back to the conversation with Guy. There was a, yeah, I mean, he's an amazing listener and asked really good questions, but I also found uh, myself entering into a space of emergence in the conversation. Just, I was sort of thoughts that I was dimly aware of or things I hadn't quite put together were actually being put together in real time and I was listening to myself talk. And that was a really, that was a really fascinating process. And there's something about being witnessed in that that allows that to happen. Uh, if you're with someone who's just waiting for their turn to talk or is kind of automatically filtering what you're saying into their kind of pre-existing structure, then it's difficult for that emergence to come about. And we actually teach uh, something in our workshops called inquiry. And inquiry comes from a slightly different background. It's a little bit older. It comes from the Ridwan school or the diamond essence work. And it's kind of like a talking meditation. So the idea and the way we introduce it in the workshops is we, we say, don't tell a story. So even, even if you're saying kind of why you're here and what you're hoping to get from this experience, don't tell a story. Try and tap into that space of where you're surprising yourself by what you're saying as you're saying it. And I imagine that there might be people watching who are asking right now a pretty valid question, which is, why bother having a conversation like that when we could just talk about ideas, you know, which is often the way we try and tackle uh, challenging or complex problems generally. So we might have a debate around it or we might um, bash, you know, bash the ideas together and I disagree and you disagree. And we, kind of, we might come to some kind of synthesis. It becomes much easier to connect ideas and for something new to synthesize in the conversation because neither of us are necessarily taking a position. And we know from uh, you know, research into mindfulness and research into similar practices that there are some pretty significant brain changes that happen when we do that, especially when we do it together. So there's a lot of evidence out there for it, but I think the most important thing is testing it out and noticing qualitatively where is the difference between when I have a, I'm in a position, you're in a position, to when we loosen that, relax the grip on it, and come with less attachment and more curiosity and see, okay, what, you know, what's really happening right now as we talk? Yeah, and it's about whether a conversation has the capacity to go into new territory. And, and that was the initial promise of the, the concept of the intellectual dark web when it first arrived. There was this sense of, it's a conversation where people could change their minds. I haven't seen a lot of that. I haven't seen a lot of people changing their minds. I haven't seen, and my great hope at the beginning was also this sense of maybe there could be a synthesis. 
so the synthesis at the at the the that could we could see these public events and then there could be this sort of synthesis and we'd be able to see okay we're holding different parts of the puzzle but but it's coming in the same direction from evolutionary biology through to psychology through to many different lenses that hasn't happened um, what was also really interesting with guy is that he was aware of the channel and has also kind of looked at the the trajectory that we've been going on and has kind of recognized that we are talking about the same thing we're talking about that same emergent quality and a lot of the the people on our channel are talking about that same emergent quality as well just the fact that you're listening for the emergent conversation just just the fact that that's what you're doing is in itself impressive to me um, and also watching how the people that you're dialoguing with are in some way co-shaping your channel and watching the channel evolve and in such a way where it almost feels that the very thing that you have your eye on um, is, is, making, is making what's emerging a kind of a self-awareness. So it's almost like rebel wisdom in a certain sense is this way in which that which is emerging in the culture is uh, saying I to itself and asking itself questions and stuff. So I've just appreciated uh, the multi-dimensions of what kind of comes through in all the things that you're doing and I really appreciate it a lot. Which is the other part of this synthesis, which is the sense that the, the, the people whose thought I'm most compelled by and most intrigued by are also kind of independently, uh, I'm sure they've influenced each other quite a bit, but they're also independently coming to this position of realizing that the, the real question is, is more about how we come to sense making at all and how we come to sense making together, how we come to collective sense making. Okay, so why can't we trust any of the things that normally look like sense making? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but basically we learn how to do signaling for intentional game theoretic purposes. And so rather than just share signal that is true and representative, we share signal that will advantage some rivalrous agenda. So most signal ends up being that. And one of the things that you were just saying is, uh, or consequence of it is that there's an ethic to not fuck up the information ecology, mm -hmm. right? Like in the same way that we say don't pollute and most people get, are pretty comfortable with don't throw your cigarette butt on the ground. Don't actually disinform anybody else for your own getting ahead or withhold information where you can avoid doing so because you're actually disempowering the sense making of others in the process and to really be tuned into is though as I'm seeking to make sense, I want to increase other people's sovereignty and their capacity to make sense. So I want to increase the intactness of the information ecology they're exposed to rather than decrease it. But glue together what Dan just said and what you just added to what I was saying. To the degree to which I'm playing this game with complete strangers out in info space who I'll never meet, I'm probably gonna lose. I don't know how much, how much info, info... Playing which game? The game of Real Omega. The game of information ecology. Because multipolar shop, someone's gonna be a dick. To the degree I'm playing with my wife, I'm probably gonna have a better life. Yeah. Right, so that's the idea. Now, the idea is, if you're playing it trying to say, okay, hold on, I'm trying to solve the game theoretic problem with complete strangers by telling the truth, anybody who understands how to do game theory is gonna say, oh, you're, you're the one who's actually the dupe. Ah, we found the suck. Don't be Ned Stark. Don't be Ned Stark, unless you're actually in Winterfell with your family. Then be Ned Stark. That's the idea, right? Don't, the key is don't go to King's Landing. Yeah. Full stop. That's the key. There's something John Verveke said when we interviewed him that comes up for me, and I wonder, I'm curious how it maps on to, to what we're talking about right now, because it was the word transjective, which I think is a fantastic word, because it's, it's this sense of, Normally we have, okay, my subjective experience, here's how I feel about this or that, and then we have some attempt between us to reach um, an agreement around, the, around objective reality. <clears throat> so, you know, but instead of those two being split off and completely separated from one another, the idea of a transjective conversation might be one in which there's a synthesis between the two and they're playing off each other and therefore we in the process of having the conversation, we start to move 
towards an objective truth, which is, which is also in part subjective. So there's, it's a paradox in a sense. It's kind of, kind of what I'm thinking of or kind of trying to feel into right now. But I think there are a lot of, uh, there's a difficulty with explaining this kind of way of having a conversation because there, there are a lot of paradoxes, it seems. But the experience of it clicks. It's more of a flow state than a regular conversation. And so things just flow and make sense and build and grow. But it's really difficult to then condense that down into talking about it. So even what we're doing now, there's, there's a paradoxical quality to it. Mm. So I'm going to play a little clip from Jordan Greenhall now, who links it really nicely. So this is another sort of link. Um, but I'm sure people who've been watching the channel for a while will be aware of this idea of broadcast and digital. Where broadcast is the underlying structure of how we've run society for millennia since World War II through a system he calls the Blue Church. The Blue Church emerged in the context of having to figure out how to navigate all of these changes and generate coherence. How do we get all of these people with these new capacities to be able to make sense of the world in some fashion that is able to then make choices together and to act effectively? Right? That's the question. And the Blue Church developed to be the answer to that question. Right? So it developed the ability to say, for example, use the education system to establish an embodied sense of vertical meritocratic hierarchy. And it's very important, that first part, that there's a relationship between authority and receptor that has a broadcast modality. So the Blue Church is very broadcast across its entire mode. There's very good reasons to believe that the Blue Church is done, meaning that it's in the senescence stage. And senescence has a characteristic where when you move into the senescence stage, you tend to go downhill pretty quickly. Now what? And how? So the, the answer now what is decentralized collective intelligence. You know, there's a developmental curve. This idea of rate and state is pretty good here. So Blue Church state of sense making, choice making, actuation high, rate down. It's getting less effective over time. Decentralized collective intelligence state low, rate high. Right, so there's going to be a crossover point. And what we see is on occasion we'll see a breakthrough where this new thing has reached a point of criticality where its capacities are now good enough to show up as actually effective in the visceral world vis-a-vis -vis the fading legacy. Um, and I think now it's actually becoming relatively commonplace to kind of see the, the struggle between blue church normative good opinion and new structures of sense making and new structures of meaning making and new structures of how those are beginning to try to cohere into actually sovereign collective intelligences that are able to do the whole the whole thing. But we're a bit of the ways there for sure. It'll take certainly single digit years um, and possibly double digit years for the whole thing to come together to a point where it's transitioned formally. I'm also going to play a little clip from Jamie Wheel, who in quite a few interviews we've done talks about how this kind of emergent coherence or emergent collective intelligence seems like it keeps breaking down. What I've been seeing lately, paying attention to this space, is it's starting to bubble up, but it feels like a wildly unstable element. And it's breaking my heart slash freaking me out slash <laughs> concerning me that we, our efforts to create group coherence seem to be going so badly so far and so i'm deeply committed to figuring out what are the rate limiters slash achilles heels missing links that can help us at least start you know failing forward making new better different mistakes because it feels like our efforts right now are actually just the last half century redux with very little go forward learning happenings. I mean there's various reasons for that. It's sort of any kind of ideological certainty will cause it to break down, which in a lot of these environments, because they're uh, probably quite liberal uh, in sort of spiral dynamics terms, quite green, often that kind of ideological certainty shows up as identity politics, as sort of a trauma-based identity, which then often will hijack the, the kind of the, the collective um, agency of, of the project. He's talked about that a few times. And I've actually had several recent um, somewhat, you know, puzzling, saddening, frustrating experiences in groups of 
rarefied air. You know, these are down to, you know, Caribbean islands with famous billionaires to solve ocean conservation or gatherings of, you know, wealth holders and wisdom keepers. So indigenous elders plus high net worth families and family offices with, you know, everybody with incredibly good intentions. And saw one hijacked in a heartbeat around gender and sort of Me Too issues, which was not the topic of conversation. And another one about ocean conservation hijacked around race. And you're like, we're here to try and save the oceans. This isn't even a human dynamic. And someone with the tiniest provocation got triggered into a personal trauma response and then into a socio-political ideological trauma response and just kicked the entire house of cards down. And you realize, oh shit, um, we have to figure that part out. And, and, if, and, and my sense is, is, you know, Ben Franklin, you know, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, he said, all right, gentlemen, you know, he said, yes, he said, a republic, if you can keep it, that, that bit that everybody knows. But he also said, we must all hang together or we shall assuredly hang separately. Right? And so that's where we are right now. And so identity politics, which, are, it's, which is fundamentally a group of collectively traumatized folks forming an identity around that trauma, right? Identity politics of all stripes, and this doesn't matter left or right. It could be incels, alt-right, 4chan, whack nuts, or it could be social justice warriors, right? And, and, and that entire community. Um, I, would, I would advocate that community on the progressive left is right. They absolutely, all those folks, all those dispossessed outgroups uh, have been subject to uh, abuses of long-term entrenched power over time. They're just not being effective at all. And in fact, they're the only people there, the only people that they are harming is the center left well-intentioned progressives who do have access to the instruments of patriarchy, post-colonial oppression, money markets, platform. And those are the only folks that are even subject, give a shit about their critique. Center right is saying, oh no, that's way too extreme for my value sets, my position, my experience. So I'm actually getting pushed away. And alt-right is gleefully trolling the libs and watching this circular firing squad on the left go down and weaponizing all the tools of postmodern classical academia, whether that's freedom of speech right, or help, help, I'm being oppressed or my voice must be heard too. And they're actually just turning and weaponizing the tools of the progressive left against themselves. So it is a stock raving shit show all around. And the key is, is if I go back into my trauma and even my in-groups, shared experience of trauma and the stories around that. And I said, and it's a little bit like kids playing, you know, sort of all day Monopoly games back in the day, you know, when we, we'd, you'd run out of banknotes and you'd start having to write IOUs, like I owe you one million extra dollars for landing on Boardwalk or Mayfair or whatever it would be, right? Um, at some point we have to come to the conclusion that um, my IOUs, what's owed me to fill the hole I believe I have from those traumatic experiences is dwarfed by the potential pain and suffering we're all staring at coming down the pike if we don't get our shit together and learn to hang together. So identity politics are a structural roadblock right now in from anything resembling group coherence on a collective mobilized scale. And I think the only way through it, and, and people experience this as well because there were in that wisdom keepers, um, wealth holders uh, retreat that I was invited to attend and speak at, uh, there were Lakota and Dine elders, so from the Navajo community and the Lakota uh, Sioux communities, and there, and actually also um, someone from Guyana, so so experiencing you know all sorts of kind of both African diaspora into you know South American colonial expression, and their affect was fundamentally different than the San Francisco social justice warrior crowd. Fundamentally different. They had actually, and, and arguably, had been experiencing far more egregious oppression and trauma for many, for even more generations. But they had come out on the other side of love. And they had come out on the other side of open embrace. And it wasn't squishy. It wasn't new agey. It was 
fierce and it was unapologetically in that stand, but it was integrated. You could absolutely tell integrated humans from wounded activists. And the integrated humans is what uh, Martin Luther King called soul force, right? And they were sourcing from soul force and it was palpable. I mean, here I am two months later still talking about that experience, that three or four days with those people and how much it's impacted just my thinking and feeling about these subjects. So the question is, is can we create catharsis, right? The, the, the metabolizing of our trauma, the digesting of our grief such that I'm no longer separate in my pain body and my narrative that wraps me around that. So it's interesting because in Jamie's book, Stealing Fire, he explores and maps out the groups who are doing this really well. So whether it's um, the Navy SEALs or you know, high-performing sports teams, and one of the things he points out is that when it's done well, when you really get a group of people together who are in that coherence, you have to be ruthless in it. You have to be ruthlessly selective and get rid of um, I think what he calls the, the gray man is the phrase that comes out, which is that person who isn't quite there and when push comes to shove, when the bullets are flying or when you're two points down, that's the person who ends up um, breaking everyone else's flow. So I kind of have that in my mind right now because we're on the cusp of um, launching our own experiment in this area, the, the Rebel Wisdom Collective Intelligence Lab. And that's, you know, we've, we've that's an open question. I know that I guess that's Jamie's inquiry and it becomes very relevant actually thinking of, okay, how, how does one go about building an experiment around this? Because it simultaneously, I think, has to, be, has to have that selection in it to see, okay, what group of people can together, you know, how can we all go somewhere new? Uh, so there's a certain element of being ruthless about it, but then of course there's the element of wanting to create a, a container and um, an experience that allows people to relax also means not being too ruthless. So that's a, that's a tension, I suppose. I think that there's two memes at work at the moment. There's the meme of collapse, and there's the meme of phase shift. And I think that it's certainly, there's a lot of uh, sense of collapse out there, and that's a, that's a big uh, thing that's certainly among the intellectual circles that we're connected to. And then there's a sense of what if that is actually a phase shift? What is that, that that's sort of what the piece that Daniel Schmachtenberger in particular is bringing. I'm saying we need an epoch shift that is not the continuation of the current curve, that is a discrete nonlinear phase shift, and that if we think about it as just continuation of current curves, okay, these things are getting better with tech, let's just hope they keep getting better, it doesn't work. Um, and so, but if we say, what are the necessary and sufficient criteria of a civilization that doesn't self-terminate in the presence of the emerging power? we can actually identify what those criteria are and they're actually things that we can do. Then that becomes the only MO that makes sense as we're going to bring that about. So in the conversation that Guy Sangstock had with John Viveki, uh, that was really, you know, it's a beautiful sort of emergent conversation between the two of them. There was one piece, well there's a couple of things that they said that just felt like real gems. And one of it was that circling is about being alive to, to what wants to emerge and being an inquiry around what wants to emerge. And that's very much, I think, where we've tried to orient the channel in terms of the kind of subjects that we're covering. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it feels certainly Glitch in the Matrix was really uh, about a, a moment of kind of making sense of the Trump and Brexit reaction. The Jordan Peterson, Kathy Newman interview as a lens to say, look, there's two worldviews here. And this one, the mainstream media in particular, has got a low resolution version of the, of the truth that is no longer fit for purpose. And that was, that was really, and then we've done a lot of interviews around sort of um, pushing back against that sort of the, the holes in the liberal worldview. And I think that that's still a valuable perspective, but I think it's also a dead end of just being, and I think a lot of people are stuck there. I sort of look at the comments thread sometimes and there's an awful lot of people that are still in that space and there is a partial truth there, but it's only a partial truth. And I, I feel personally less and less. We can also talk about who in the IDW, the intellectual dark web, has become stuck in that as well. But there's a lot of people that just, just want to kind of hear that. And you can always find enough evidence that the left has gone crazy. And as someone who certainly feels politically homeless, there is a sense that the left has gone crazy in a lot of ways, uh, but there's craziness on both sides. And if you're only seeing one side of the picture, then 
you're almost certainly likely to be ideologically captured on the other side. I've started noticing, certainly over the last six months at least, that people I know in, in fairly progressive circles, they know how damaging identity politics is. And it's a, it's, it doesn't feel like it's a sort of something that I'm ur I feel an urgent need to make people aware of. Most sensible people in progressive circles who I know are recognizing that there's a problem. And so banging the drum continues to be like rah, 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 doesn't seem particularly productive. This is exactly, yeah, just after I'd finished saying those last things, that was exactly the missing piece that I realized. That conversation, I think we've seen so many people from Jamie Wheel onwards who said he had his kind of awakening moment a couple of years ago where he was like, whoa, I got taken down by vitriol and hate from the left that I never expected to be there. And I've seen that likewise time and time again. So I don't feel the need to keep pushing at that, at that door. I'm interested in where are the possibilities for synthesis with those people who started to notice the toxicity on, on their side and both sides to be honest because it, those kind of <laughs> bad psychology and damaged people exist on all sides of the, of, of the spectrum. I think there is a danger of getting stuck in there because it becomes its own ideology and it also has the uh, detrimental effect of encouraging us to see the other as their ideology or their belief system rather than a much more complex human, which is what exactly what the kind of conversations that we're talking about help us to do. And it becomes less important what the ideological leaning is because that, that's quite surface level. And once we get down to the level of values and then even further into the individual story and that all of those things mixed together, uh, much of the conflict, in my experience, much of the conflict kind of drops away. It doesn't mean we agree on everything, but it means that we have some kind of, we can even disagree and have you know, this kind of back and forth with that, but we're disagreeing as two human beings, not two projections of different uh, belief systems. So what we've been talking about a lot recently and planning a lot um, for the autumn is how do we do this practically or how do we start experimenting with doing this practically. Um, one really useful practical tool that um, we have Daniel Schmachtenberger, Jordan Hall, Jamie Will talking about is something called Rule Omega. But I actually was feeling into and wanted to speak to the kind of topology you were noticing because there's a, something that I noticed about it that I think is actually really nice. So we could ask, is it because Jamie is sitting in the corner and it's literally just the physicality of it? There's probably a number of factors, but it makes heaps of sense that you and I have actually got to have more conversations on these topics more recently than we have. There's kind of an assumed yep. knowing we didn't all get to jam before on this or prepare this. This is real time extemporaneous. And I don't know if you've ever even expressed rule Omega to Jamie, but he's just doing it. Yeah. And he's kind of openly inquiring into the questions that are really alive. And it's a little bit easier for us to riff off what each other are saying because we've got some recently shared language on these things. And, but the rule Omega is actually a really simple practical thing that I, towards coherence that I would like everybody yeah. here to get is if, if Jordan and I are talking, or if you and I are talking, like we, we have this, and I think we naturally have it, but it's worth making explicit, is if you say something that sounds ridiculous to me, or batshit crazy or wrong, I actually give the benefit of the doubt that you might have a reason that I didn't understand first. So rather than just default into you're probably wrong, I'll ask more questions. Mm -hmm. and, and that giving the benefit of the doubt that you actually might have something useful to say mm -hmm. increases my making sure that I understand you before I'm responding. And that actually, and the disagreeing with something that you weren't even saying because I didn't seek to understand well enough creates very turbulent flow rather than laminar flow breaks down coherence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If people could just do that yeah. towards coherence, if they could just give the benefit of the doubt that each other, that everyone has some signal, yeah. even if it's on a very different part of reality than the part they're focused on, and even if there's noise involved, and they're listening for the signal first, right. that would change everything. That's a starting place. So Daniel expresses something, and let's say he's trying to express something that's hard, which by the way, the rule is designed for that kind of a thing. Uh -huh. Like, 
I'm not interested in having conversations that aren't actually trying to break new ground. So, okay, do it, dude. So he expresses something hard. And in the expression, 98% is noise and 2% is signal. Like the jazz riff. But what happens is, is that my job is to actually do two things. One, hold all of it. Not just say, fuck it, that, was, that wasn't 100% right, so I'm just going to nuke it. Hold all of it. Then, in myself, discernment, to what degree can I express something back that gets rid of the 50 per, 50% that is noise? So now I've got 6% signal. Express it back. And of course, if he can then do that, and now you, three is even better, a more profound instrument, because you're going to be bringing a different perspective. Perhaps you can take it and actually zoom in on it down to the point where we're actually 50% signal. That's the idea. Right? And so one, it's an invitation to say, hey, we're trying to do something that's hard. Let's all try to do something that's hard and be willing to take the risk of not speaking elegantly and on the premise that everyone else is doing their absolute fucking level best to hear that which is trying to speak itself through you and listening to themselves like, oh, there it is, tone, got it. There's something beautiful and clear there. Here's what I heard. And that's really mega. And there's a psychological safety that's created to be able to try out new stuff, knowing that we know we're trying out new stuff and we're giving the benefit of the doubt. So it, it actually does become more explorative and that's where you get more novelty. <laughs> and then I imagine, actually I don't know if this is true for Daniel, I imagine it's true for you, but certainly if it's true for me, is that I'm also noticing in myself like this constant, you know, when you're meditating you feel this, this constant chatter and flow of like all the things that are going on internally that are either like certain ideas are popping up or emotional responses. Some of them are like social emotional responses. Some of them are like, just like, I gotta pee. And like being able to actually notice all that chatter internally and do the discernment interior and say, okay, but all that chatter, which part of that's actually signal? Oh shit. But listening to all of it, you have to have, you have, really make it goes in and out, right? I'm listening to myself fully and I'm listening to the, to the others fully and trying to use discernment to continuously allow that process to turn lead into gold. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Now there's a really important distinction that we're saying something that is different than the way that some people think about multi-perspectivism, which is we're not saying, I'm not saying, all perspectives are equally valid. And I'm also not saying that there is no way to integrate them into higher order understanding. I'm saying all perspectives have some signal. Mm -hmm. Generally have some noise. <laughs> and that perspective is itself a reduction of information on the reality being perceived. Mm. And that's from actually... The, from the quantum foam of it all. From just the definition actually of... Observer, observing, observed, I can't uh, take myself out of reality to observe it in a unitary way. And if I'm observing you now versus in a different state, I'm going to observe different things, right? Someone else at a different time. If I'm observing the west side of the house versus the east side of the house versus the aerial view versus inside the house, they all give me some signal, some truth about the nature of the house. None of them give me the whole truth of the nature of the house because it's a 3D object with interiority and depth, and I can't collapse it perfectly into a 2D picture, mm. right? So perspective itself is a reduction on information complexity. So the first part, I give rule omega to myself that my perspective has some signal, but I'm also positive it's incomplete. I think it's necessary to kind of put a little flag in there and say that you can't do this sort of thing with everyone. If people are showing up not able to or not wanting to enter into that kind of dialogue, I don't think you can, I don't think you can, I think you have to, both parties or more than one party have to be willing and able and attempting to enter into the kind of intersubjective conversation. But I'm really struck by some of the images and analogies that are used and the, sort of the idea of the jazz riff. And I'm noticing that as a player in the jazz band, that feeling of not being sub coordinated to the whole, but actually somehow being supported and achieving a higher level of individuation is felt. And it feels like there also needs to be a, a tolerance for ambiguity and a willingness to get messy. So back to the jazz guys, I mean, consistently the most righteous jams come out of kind of going in down into the mud as a band. 
you know, someone's off noodling, exploring a theme, or, you know, and it's not actually danceable, it's not anything, and it's even to the point of just unspooling entirely, and then some Quicksilver starlight comes out of that, you know, and then it all gels, and it's that patience, to your point about timing, Jordan, you know, it's the patience to let it all come undone in order to come back together in some new emergent form that seems almost essential. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, like when you were described, because I, I mean, as soon as you described organisms, organs, and that, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So social media, digital narcissism, fucking scraping everybody else's jam, biting people's rhymes, poaching people's dharma, feels like the cancerous yeah. um, impulse that we're experiencing right now. And when we come, when we glimpse this emergence, or, or of, of coherence, it's sort of like, oh, your, you know, your life's work and special, like the thing you're uniquely designed to do, you know, what in a traditional sense might be called Dharma, you know, fits perfectly with the thing I'm uniquely here to do. And holy shit, I was carrying this thing. It was lonely, it was hard, it was scary, it was heavy. But now I think that actually these pieces lay down beside each other and now we're actually beginning to see a picture that none of us held and none of us could see. And that to me is like, I think how this happens. Right. But on the other hand, we're also having people be like, hmm, that's a pretty damn picture. Let me just scribble it and snap a selfie and fucking post it. So sort of the implicit morals as well, which actually reminds me of, there's, an, there's a Camus um, phrase where he said, what I know most certainly about morality, I owe to football, which was beautiful. And it's sort of, we, we know these implicit rules, like these implicit rules in football is, for example, if you give the ball away there's an incentive on you to get to get it back. There's you always stick up for your for your buddies. There's there's yeah there, there's an ethic of fair play that you're playing within that you're all implicitly aware of. And I think the jazz riff is a really beautiful thing because if you play music, you know kind of what that means. It's like if, as soon as you bring in sort of this egoic space of I'm going to shine at anyone else's expense, or you're not kind of picking up your own weight then we, we understand what that feels like. I love the jazz metaphor. It's very uh, kind of alive for me. And also what I think is useful about it is it's really worth keeping in mind, I think, with this whole idea or this whole <clears throat> experiment of building collective intelligence is that there is a flow and a kind of messiness and a fun to it as well, as well as doing, as, as kind of all coming together and you know, perhaps talking about ideas that are very important. There is a, there's a fluidity to it and there's a joy to it, ideally. There's a kind of, um, yeah, there should be some element, I think, or is some element of messiness to it, where we're feeling into things and we're making mistakes and we're fixing them and we're, we're kind of uh, together forming something. So that, that aliveness, I think, is really important to highlight and, and bring out. I guess if people are convinced, like, okay, this is possible, it's, it's possible to do in certain environments, and maybe one-on-one -on -one with, with your partner, for example, to create intimacy in small groups of people, collect, creating this sort of uh, more than the sum of its parts. That's, there's a big difference or there's a big gap still from how do you take something that might be possible in small groups and a whole shift of society. What um, the Greenhall, Schmachtenberger talk about game A versus game B. Game A being sort of uh, rivalrous, zero-sum, game-theoretic dynamics to something else. And I really loved uh, an analogy that Jordan used in the trialogue about a super-saturated solution. I'm going to play the clip now. But we're, we're all familiar with the notion of how a super-saturated solution does a phase transition to crystallization. Yeah. That, I think, is the answer. If you actually do this thing where what your, your field effect, which is to say your open-source broadcast, is bringing more and more people into a poised state where their ability to move into coherence is becoming easier and easier and easier. Then what ends up happening is that a small amount that actually does drop into coherence creates a crystallization phase transition that could actually scale extremely rapidly. So I guess the analogy there is that by disseminating this and I guess mainstreaming the practices as well, I don't think there's a shortcut to to getting there. It's, it's something you can't talk your way to. We have to do the, the work of tuning the instrument, so kind of continue the, the jazz metaphor. And that, that involves dealing with all of the individual things that we have that will bring us out of the ability to be in coherence with other people, that defensiveness or that 
uh, our own personal stuff. And it's a tool to develop. I mean, we've been doing, uh, we've trained as counselors using this method, done quite a lot of inquiry. Um, I, I'm still definitely learning this experience and it's, it's, it's something that we get better and better. I guess it's like learning to meditate or something like that. It's something that very, very, very few people are actually, you would say, like good at it, able to kind of achieve really transformational states. But to be able to start doing that kind of work and, and to learn to tune the instrument into what's feeling alive and what's feeling emergent in the moment is, is the work to be done. But there's only so much that can be done by talking about it. And so, yeah, I would say it is work, but it's also play. It, they're, they're kind of combined. There's a fluidity to it. And it's a much more, it's a wonderful skill. I think, like you said, it's a skill that I think we're, we're forever learning. So what we're doing is we've planned three sessions of what we're calling the Rebel Wisdom Collective Intelligence Lab. And they're going to take place in London. So it's three evenings in October. And we're selecting a, a group of what we're hoping to kind of all experiment together with different practices, so different modalities. So from, so, you know, we already mentioned circling, meditation, breath. We're still developing what's actually going to happen in those evenings. And from that, I think we'll all get a sense of, okay, what really worked? What really allowed us to have a conversation that went somewhere deeper? And so we're going to combine the conversation with the practices. And the conversation might be around a topic that, that's quite um, you know, culturally punchy or difficult to discuss, so that we can actually see what actually made it easier for us to go there with each other, even if we you know, disagree on it. Could we get some kind of synthesis together? What practice was it? And we don't know yet. You know, we have... So I have some ideas about what might work, but I'm also quite uh, excited to be proven completely wrong <laughs> and to discover something completely new. Yeah, and for me, that's why this feels like a kind of punctuation point in the evolution of the project, because it's all of these techniques and all of this collective intelligence work only works when it's pointed in a certain direction. Like there's, there are things that we, that we will need to be discussing. So the conversations around hot button political or cultural topics with this as the sort of operating system is is the content so this is more about the form and i think that the, the the journey of the channel has been increasingly sort of getting down to the the foundations it's like what are the foundations what is required okay i think this is the foundation these are the foundations and the only way to do that is to to go into is, is, is to each of us do the work of finding out how we're closed down and reopening to curiosity, to openness, to, to, to kind of evolutionary, the evolutionary current, for want of a better word, and, and trying to avoid framing it in any language that, that sounds too loaded in whatever way, but also realizing that most modalities, most languages have some signal. So it's extracting what is really useful from those, from those frames. And I think from this particular sort of counselling, um, personal growth frame, there's some incredibly useful stuff that I think needs to become part of the conversation because the reason why these conversations are breaking down is because of a neglect and a miss on, and, and a lack of understanding of exactly that. So if anyone's interested in that, we'll put the link below this video to um, express your interest uh, on our website. Yeah, and I guess there's also the possibility and the hope that if we create something that kind of works as a protocol, we can then roll it out. There's, we're always being contacted by people around the world saying we do events in our cities, or and, and perhaps if we come up with a Rebel Wisdom protocol, that's something that we can roll out. And open source that kind of information, open source that, that structure. Uh, which leads me on to a little kind of direct appeal. If you're not a su subscriber or supporter of us, uh, please do consider being a supporter. It basically is how we are funding, how we're able to keep going. We are a sense-making enterprise and we're really looking to expand in all the different ways that we can. We're looking to make more films, we're looking to run more events, we're looking to employ more people if we can. And of course, if you do become a supporter, there's lots of benefits to that. There's a lot of exclusive films on the website. And we also do regular group calls uh, for all of our high value supporters, 
where for this latest one, we've got John Vivekey coming in and asking questions, answering questions, sorry. Uh, and also this sense of a sort of building community of people who are asking very similar questions, which I know has been of a lot of value to the supporters who've already done it. And it's real value to us as well, because we get to connect with you and, and hear from you, sort of take the temperature of where this sort of sense-making enterprise is going. And to be honest, the relationships with the supporters is really, really valuable for that. It's a sense-making check, and they're constantly coming up with ideas, coming up with questions, and part of directing the evolution of the channel uh, in many different ways. If you resonate with what we're doing, helping us do more of it, and knowing that we'll be keeping going and doing more of this stuff, whatever it is.